Hi, John Morgan here with the Keep Growing Podcast. In this episode, we're going to be taking a look at a type of plants that's kind of risen in popularity over the last few years, and that's succulents. And succulents, they're kind of hard to define because the definition for a succulent is so broad. It's really any type of plant that has large, fleshy leaves, stems, or any other part of the plant. So there's over 25 plant families that have succulents, and it literally covers everything from aloe to cacti to zebra plants. (laughs) I guess you could say hello to my little friend. (laughs) Sorry, I couldn't resist. In this week's episode, we're going to be speaking with Cassidy Tuttle. And... I first found her through YouTube. Uh, She has a great YouTube channel where she shares tips for caring for succulents. So Cassidy is a professional photographer turned succulent addict and blogger. She's currently based in the Phoenix, Arizona area and is striving to help succulents stay alive in the extreme heat. She is convinced that anyone can grow succulents if they just take a minute to understand how to adapt the care needs to where they live. Let's get right into the interview. Succulents are a little bit different than maybe most houseplants in that they do not like to be wet for very long and they need a lot of sunlight. So a lot of people say that succulents are good houseplants. And while I wouldn't say they're bad house plants, uh, most of the common varieties that people see, so like the echeverias that are, you know, the really colorful rosette shapes, um, those tend to not love being indoors. Uh, they tend to do better outdoors where they're getting more sunlight. But basically, you just want to make sure they're getting plenty of sun. They're getting um, watered regularly, but not daily. So the way that I recommend watering is to soak the soil and let it dry out completely. And then if you're indoors, I recommend giving it another two to three days and then watering again after that. Um, But that way they get a lot of water, they have time to soak it up, but they also have that period of drought where they can put out strong roots and just um, get used to being in dry soil and get used to that period of drought. Yeah, I find that's, even with regular houseplant, that that's usually the biggest sticking point is water. Um, I like to say people tend to kill plants with love. Uh, yes. They tend to overwater. And uh, with with succulents, does container size also affect like watering? Um, yeah. Say large containers versus I've seen you know in stores these little teeny tiny succulent containers and I always wonder about watering with those. Yeah, so it does make a difference. Um, I mean, just from the soil standpoint of if there's more water in the pot, it's going to take longer for the soil to dry out. But the other thing with succulents is their roots are pretty shallow, so you don't really need a super deep pot. So a lot of times you'll see succulents planted in more of a bonsai style pot where it's just maybe an inch or two deep rather than like a giant, um, you know, two foot, three foot planter. Those work as well, but um, because their roots tend to be more shallow and wide, they don't need to be as deep, but they can also be planted in extremely small pots as well. Like I have some that are in pots that are about an inch in diameter And the thing that's cool about that is succulents will kind of grow and expand to the pot that they're given. So if you put them in a really small pot where they don't have room to grow, um, they won't grow very much. They'll get to a certain point and then they can't really grow much beyond that. And so their growth will slow down more and you also don't have to water as frequently. Okay. So that, that kind of goes against kind of what I was thinking was, you know, with a smaller pot, you'd have to water more. Uh, So it's kind of counterintuitive. Yeah. And I guess it kind of depends on the overall size of the pot. So like for those one inch pots, if it's full of roots um, and depending on kind of depends on the type of succulent too, but um, a lot of people do like a cactus in there and you could get away with watering that maybe once a month because the cactus is full of water. um, The roots, you know, have 
basically filled up as much as they can, and then it'll just kind of sit and it won't grow. So one of the ways to restrict growth with succulents is to limit their water. Um, the more you water, the more they'll grow. But if you can find that sweet spot where they're getting enough to stay alive, but not so much that they're growing a lot, um, that works really well indoors. But if you're if you have them in more of like a you know three or four inch pot, still fairly small, you will generally need to water a little bit more frequently than a bigger pot. Um, but a lot of it really with succulents depends on the types that you're growing. So the soil will take longer to dry out in a big pot versus a smaller pot. But the other thing that's really important to consider when growing succulents is the the leaf size or thickness. So one of the kind of common varieties is um, it's called Porta lacaria afra or elephant's bush, elephant food. And that one has really thin leaves. And so it needs water more frequently. Um, but if you're if you have that in the same pot with say like an aloe vera or something that has really thick leaves or really big leaves, um, the plant with bigger leaves won't need water as often because it already has more stored. So it tends to be more drought tolerant. Um, and anything that's well rooted can go a lot longer. You know, anything that has a bigger, deeper root system can go longer without water. So like it, it's at the basics, that's why I recommend, you know, the soak and dry method. Mm -hmm. But the place where it gets tricky is when you have, you know, thousands of different varieties and there are definitely some nuances to which ones need more water, which ones don't need it as frequently. We've talked a little bit about uh, container saws. Um, what about soil? Like what type of soil mix would you recommend for succulents? So this is a big one for me. So I feel like soil is actually most people's problem when they're growing succulents, more so than water, but the soil causes the watering problem. So um, most nurseries or garden centers um, and succulent growers plant their succulents in a really um, dense soil. And a lot of times it'll be peat based, but there's not a lot of air pockets or airflow in the soil, um, whereas succulents like a really well draining soil. So ideally you'd have your succulents planted in a soil that has roughly a quarter inch particle size. So it's gonna look more like a really coarse sand than soil. So this, the mix that I recommend, um, there's a guy that has actually put together um, a succulent mix that I found through a forum that a lot of people just swear by and love and it has made all the difference for me. Um, so there's a guy named Jack, his website's bonsaijack.com, and he actually now makes a bagged mix of what we consider like the perfect succulent soil, um, specifically for indoor growing. And that mix is one part pine bark fines, one part crushed granite, and then one part turfus. And turfus is, it's actually a product that gets used, you can find kind of a knockoff version of it at like an auto parts store called oil dry. And it's just used to absorb oil spills or things like that to kind of do cleanup. Mm. But it's just a high fired clay that absorbs water, but will stay relatively dry to the touch. Um, and a lot of people ask like, where can you find, you know, all of these components? And for me, the biggest thing is just looking for some sort of alternative that again, you have that quarter inch particle size. So the pine bark finds, you could really use any type of organic material as long as the particle size is about a quarter inch. And then you want two parts that are inorganic. So um, crushed granite, pumice, you can use perlite. Perlite tends to um, be crushed easily. So it doesn't maintain the particle size very well. Um, but most of the time you can find um, a suitable alternative to those products, um, you know, at Home Depot or Lowe's, but yeah, just looking for something that's really gritty and drains really well. And that is where succulents will thrive because it allows plenty of room for their roots to grow, allows for a lot of airflow, um, between the soil. It dries quickly, it drains well, and it encourages encourages the succulents to put out these fine feeder roots 
and not necessarily like fine, really small and thin, but um, a lot of times when succulents are planted in a really dense soil, they'll get like one or two really thick roots instead of a really balanced root system that has a lot of um, smaller roots, which is healthier for them in the long run and allows them to withstand drought conditions a lot better. And it also makes them less likely to have problems with rot. Whereas if you have like a super thick root and it stays wet for too long, um, it's more prone to rotting or collapsing. Whereas the fine roots, you just have a really good balance and like distribution of water. So it can uptake what it needs, but nothing is getting too wet or staying wet for too long. With watering where you're kind of doing the soak and dry method, you kind of have a little bit of flow through of the water. Um, so what do you recommend for like fertilizing? So the fertilizer that I have been using most, a friend gave it to me a couple of years ago and I've just continued using it since then, but it's actually a manure tea fertilizer. Um, so there's a lady in Southern California that makes it and I've seen a few others pop up, um, but basically it's just an organic fertilizer, um, kind of the same idea as using, you know, compost, um, but it's, it has a lot of nutrients in it, but it's also fairly mild. So one of the problems with the more like traditional fertilizers is they tend to be really concentrated mm -hmm. and that can be problematic for succulents because it can like burn the roots and sometimes even burn um, the plant leaves itself. So if you do use a more traditional fertilizer, I recommend getting something that's just balanced. So maybe it's like a 555, 10, 10, 10, something like that. And then diluting it and applying it maybe a little more frequently, but at a much lower strength. And that way you're less likely to burn the succulents. Um, but yeah, generally just a balanced fertilizer. And if you're growing them indoors, I would, I probably wouldn't fertilize at all because most succulents aren't going to get enough light to justify that boost in growth. Mm -hmm. And so you'll end up seeing some stretching or leaning and it'll grow a little bit faster than the amount of light that it's getting. But for outdoor succulents, or if you move your indoor succulents outside, um, I'd recommend fertilizing maybe once in the spring and once in the fall. And if you want them to like really grow a lot more, you could do it more frequently throughout the summer, but just again, doing it in really um, low doses or just really diluted um, quantities. Okay. And that kind of hit on the next question that I had. And that was if you're growing inside and you start to see stretch, what type of lighting would you recommend? Yeah. So the thing that I've found to work best is either an LED or a fluorescent bulb and something that's just daylight balanced. So you can spend a lot of money on really intense, specific grow lights, but I've tried a lot of different types of lights. And the best thing that I have found is just a daylight balanced bulb. Um, the great thing about LEDs or um, fluorescent lights is they don't get very hot. Mm -hmm. So incandescent lights, um, you tend to have problems with the heat and that causing problems for the succulents, but um, fluorescent and especially LEDs um, work really well. And then just placing them, I would get as bright a light as you can handle for the area that you're growing and then placing it about 12 to 18 inches away from your succulents. I would start a little bit further away and gradually move it closer. So maybe starting like two feet away and then bringing it down more to 18 inches um, just so that it you can, you can burn them with getting too much light or cause them to like dry up. And so just easing them into more light is always a good idea. But um, the daylight balance bulbs are usually um, 5,500 Kelvin up to like 6,500 Kelvin. So you're looking for that bluish toned light. It's not a blue light, but just, you know, the daylight balanced cooler, cooler colors. And like if you're setting it up on a timer... Of course, that kind of depends on the ambient light, but uh, generally how many hours of, of light uh, would they need? So I recommend trying to mimic your natural daylight as much mm -hmm. as possible. Um, but, you know, in the winter when you tend to get less light, um, I would normally run a grow light for about 10 to 12 hours. 
and then still keeping it if you can by, you know, the window. So you're getting some of that natural light, but I wouldn't run it much longer than 12 hours because they, they do still need that period of dark to go through their normal growth cycles. When it comes to both growing indoors and outdoors, are there any pests that you need to look out for? Yes. So the two that I found to be most common are uh, fruit flies. And then the other one is mealybugs. So the thing with fruit flies is people try all kinds of tricks to like trap them and get rid of them. But the reason why fruit flies come around or exist is because soil is staying wet for too long or something in the area is staying wet for too long. And really the best solution for fruit flies is just to let the soil dry out completely and make sure that there's not any sort of like if, you know, if they're in their, your kitchen or something, if there's rotting food or bananas that are starting to get super ripe, that'll usually attract the fruit flies. Um, but the easiest way to kill them is just to let the soil dry out completely, which you should be doing anyway with succulents. Um, and you can put out like a little apple cider vinegar trap, just, you know, a bowl with apple cider vinegar in it and just a couple drops of dish soap to trap them in. Um, some people will cover it with like plastic and poke a little hole in it. Like I said, there's some, there are some creative ways to kind of trap those and get rid of them um, once they've already shown up. But prevention is really the best way and just letting the soil stay dry um, completely. And then with mealybugs, usually mealybugs show up if you're buying new plants and they've hitched a ride on the new plants. Um, but they tend to really like new growth and weakened growth. So when succulents aren't getting enough light indoors, they tend to lose their color, they tend to stretch out, and the new growth is just not very healthy. Um, and that's usually when mealybugs seem to show up. I've been trying to figure out what actually like causes them to grow and haven't found a good answer for that. But um, I tend to notice it more when the succulents are um, weak for some reason. So whether that's lack of light or they'll also show up a lot when succulents are getting ready to bloom because the plant is putting so much effort into that bloom that it's kind of forgetting about the rest of the plant and the leaves. Mm. And so mealybugs tend to show up a lot when succulents are in bloom. And with those, with mealybugs, um, the best treatment and cheapest treatment I found is actually just to use isopropyl alcohol. And I just put it in a spray bottle and spray it on top of the mealybugs and just drench the plant, drench the mealybugs with the alcohol. And that seems to do a pretty good job um, getting rid of them. You do have to be careful, though, not to put your plants in direct sunlight or even very bright sunlight after spraying with the alcohol. Um, it can cause some problems down the road, but um, like a, it can look like burning a little bit. But if you just spray them really well with the isopropyl alcohol, 70%, and then just rinse it off with water a little bit later, usually you shouldn't have any issues with damage to the succulent. Um, you can also use any sort of regular pesticide, um, but same as with the fertilizer, I'd recommend diluting it just because succulents tend to be really sensitive to chemicals and um, can burn easily. Um, I've used... Um, safer soap is one of the other treatments I've used for mealybugs, and that's worked pretty well. A lot of people ask about neem oil, and unless it's really diluted, neem oil can be pretty hard on your succulents and can end up killing them, which if your goal is just to get rid of the mealybugs and you end up killing your succulent, that doesn't really work out. So I try and stay away from neem oil, but the great thing about the isopropyl alcohol is it's really cheap. And so even if you have to apply it a few times to get rid of everything, it usually ends up working as well and being a lot cheaper than most of the pesticides that are out there. Yeah, neem oil, it can be a double-edged sword with many plants. I I wiped down an entire bed of nasturtiums one year at my house with neem oil. So. <laughs> yeah, and I know for like... It's not very common for succulents to get like a systemic infection, but it does happen. And neem oil is one that I have heard people using to treat it. But like you're saying, like it's so easy to, to kill your plant off, mm. um, you know, and if it has a systemic infection, kind of hard to recover anyway. But yeah, just being really careful with most treatments and maybe watering them down or just applying it in really small amounts. What are some plants and I know... When it comes to succulents, there's such a huge range 
of varieties. And you can kind of break them up into different different groups like cold hardy succulents and soft succulents. But what are some plants that you would recommend for those just getting started to kind of give them the best chance of success? For growing indoors specifically, um, I would recommend getting, um, there's a plant called Haworthia fasciata or zebra plant is its common name. And that one is hands down my favorite for new succulent growers. It's surprisingly tolerant of any type of problems you throw at it. So if you tend to be an overwatering person, um, it can tolerate that pretty well, but it's also extremely drought tolerant if you tend to forget about your plants. So it's, it's a good one that's really forgiving and it does well in low light, but really anything in the Haworthia family tends to be a pretty good beginner plant and do well indoors. Um, another group that's good for indoors are gasterias. And they're really similar to Horthias. Um, They're pretty tough plants. They tend to do better with less water. Um, so if you like to water frequently, probably don't go with the Gasteria. But um, they are really good for indoors. And then for outdoor growing, a lot would depend on your growing zone. But Semper Vivums or Hens and Chicks um, are cold hardy, um, which is something you mentioned. So those, a lot of them can grow in, they grow in zone four, um, zone five climates, and a lot of them will even grow in zone four climates. So I lived in Utah. Well, I grew up in Utah and grew succulents there for quite a while. And we have a whole like couple of beds full of Semper Vivum succulents at my parents' house. And they go through all kinds of weather from heat in the summer with ice and snow in the winter uh, my mom had a pot on her porch that would get the runoff from the rain gutters if they overflowed. And so it was literally under ice almost the entire winter. And those Semper Vivums came back just looking better than ever. So they're pretty impressive. And a lot of people don't realize that there are succulents that can be grown in a four season climate like that. Um, but those are usually pretty good for beginners as well. The ones I'd actually stay away from if you're a beginner and not confident in your plant skills um, are echeverias. And the sad thing about that is that's what a lot of people see and would recognize as succulents as these really colorful rosettes. Mm -hmm. uh, but they tend to not do very well indoors. They need a lot of sunlight, um, but they can also be finicky outdoors too, and they can burn easily. But the biggest thing with those is that they do not like a lot of water. So they tend to be on the very uh, low end of the watering scale. So they like very infrequent watering and really thrive on that soak and dry method. So those I would not recommend unless you're ready to like be really dedicated to keeping them alive and figuring out what to do. Um, but they, there are some of those that are easier than others. Um, the first one that comes to mind is Echeveria Pearl von Nuremberg. It's a pretty common one and tends to be a little bit more forgiving than others. And then the other one that the other kind of group that I would recommend would be crassulas. So those are your um, jade plants. And those tend to do pretty well indoors. Um, some of them that are more colorful, like a crassula campfire, won't love growing indoors, but your you know typical jade plant or there's like a miniature jade variety, those will do really well indoors. And there's quite a bit of variety in shape and texture with the crassulas, which is really fun. Um, but they, they tend to be more forgiving with over and under watering. They can kind of handle some stress in that way. So the crassulas, haworthias, gasterias, and then semper vivums, those would be my main four kind of groups that I would recommend. This has been some great information. Um, if people want to find out more, what are some uh, good ways that they can get in touch with you? and find out some more information. Yeah, so we actually have a free course that kind of helps you figure out what succulents will grow well for you and then goes through the basic care a little more in depth than what we've talked about today. Um, and you can get to that just at succulentsforbeginners.com. Um, and then if you want to know more and kind of just browse, you can just go to succulentsandsunshine.com and um, you can sign up for the free course there as well. But we have a blog with a bunch of articles 
a lot of different FAQs. And then the thing that we've been working on lately is um, we call them our types of succulents. So it's like a little a Wikipedia-ish type article about specific varieties and their individual care needs. So if you buy a new plant, you could go to that section and see like, okay, it needs to be getting a lot of sunlight or it's better for indoors and that kind of thing. So that's all there at succulentsandsunshine.com. Again, I want to thank Cassidy for sharing this great information. This episode's gardening wisdom comes from the comedian Dimitri Martin. He says, I bought a cactus. A week later, it died. And I got depressed because I thought, dang, I'm less nurturing than a desert. (laughs) Until next time, keep nurturing your succulents and keep growing. For links, videos, and more about this episode, check out our show notes at bobsmarket.com slash keep growing. If you're listening on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or other platforms, be sure to give us a review. You can also learn more about Bob's Market through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and more. If you want to contact me directly with questions, comments, or smart remarks, shoot me an email at keepgrowing at bobsmarket.com. The music in this week's episode is by Silent Partner. Copyright 2019, Bob's Market at Greenhouses, Incorporated. <laughs>